So as I said, today we are concluding our journey with Jesus. Uh, we've been we really kind of started this journey when Jesus introduced himself on the banks of the Jordan River when uh, John the Baptist looked up in that great, that great line, look, behold, the Lamb of God. Up until Jesus decides to give himself, to give himself up um, as a Savior of the world and be crucified. It's been a really interesting journey, and we've covered a lot of things um, from the, the beginning of this. Last time we met, Jesus had kind of made his way into the city of Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. Passover was that great, great feast where they remind themselves uh, about the, the, the departure from the nation of Egypt and the people of Israel kind of set free. Jesus was got, kind of spending time outside the city of Jerusalem with his disciples, and he had made his way in. And on his way in, there was a crowd of people lining the streets outside the city and even into the city, waving palm branches, saying, here comes the king, here comes the king. Hosanna, Hosanna. This is why today is called Palm Sunday, to remember that there was a time when Jesus made his way in. And the nation of Israel, in the city of Jerusalem, the people expected him to be the king. They were expecting him to be the Messiah, to set up his kingdom and his reign. On his way into the city, he, uh, the crowds are there, and he had won the crowds over, and they're cheering for him. But Jesus had an opponent, and his opponent was really the church. It was, it was the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. And they had made plans to, to, to thwart Jesus' move, to kind of get at Jesus. But, but they couldn't get to him because he was always surrounded by a crowd. They knew they couldn't get to Jesus when the crowd was around because Jesus had won the crowd, he had won the people, and in their mind, he had won the nation. As a matter of fact, the text tells us at one point, someone in the, the Pharisee says this, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look, the whole world has gone after him. Jesus makes his way into the city, hearing the cheers of Hosanna, Hosanna. You're the king. Here comes the king. And they knew they had lost the battle. But they had a plan. They put a plan in place, a plan in motion, to separate Jesus from the crowd so that they could arrest him and ultimately so that they could execute him. Jesus makes his way in to celebrate Passover with his disciples. And, and at this time, this is a really interesting conversation. So much is said and there's so much detail they're, they're celebrating what happens with the people of Israel and, and their departure from Egypt. And he says, no, I don't want you to do this anymore. As a matter of fact, he takes this opportunity to introduce something brand new. You see, a lot of people thought when Jesus came, he was an and to their, to their Judaism, to their religion. This is Judaism 2.0. But instead of being an and, Jesus was really an, an instead of. And he took this opportunity to introduce a brand new covenant. He completed the covenant that was made between God and Abraham. And, and he brought a new covenant from the covenant that was established with the people and the nation of Israel and Moses on Mount Sinai. And he instituted a new covenant, a new relational arrangement between God and mankind. Not just the nation of Israel, not just the people of that region, but for all of mankind forever. A new covenant that would be fulfilled, that would be the fulfillment of what was and the introduction of something completely brand new. And just like all covenants, just like all contracts, there are terms and conditions. Like the, the other contracts in, in years past, this wasn't going to be a, a, a covenant with 600 plus laws. This wasn't even going to be a covenant with 10 commandments. This wasn't even going to be a covenant with two. The terms and conditions of this covenant, Jesus talked about that night. And it's really just one. The new covenant commandment was this. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. This would be the overarching ethic, the overarching ethic for morality for his brand new movement, the church that he would lead. This would be the mark of all of those who follow Jesus, who become Jesus followers. This would be the way, this would be that people live their lives. This would be the thing. This would be it. As Jesus has loved us, so we must go and love one another. Imagine that night for the disciples. What a night. Jesus establishes a brand new covenant. He introduces this brand new command. They're sitting there, they're enjoying their dinner. And then he, you know, he changes the whole paradigm, this whole thing they grew up with about remembering Moses, remembering the people of Israel and the departure from Egypt. And he says, no, no, I don't want you to do that anymore. The next time you do this, I don't want you to remember Israel and their departure. I want you to remember me. And what a radical kind of off the cuff, even like heretical statement to these young men. I want you to remember me. I want you to remember my body that's been broken. I want you to remember my blood that's been shed. And they're thinking, this is confusing because your body's not broken and you're not bleeding. I don't understand what's going on, Jesus. As the night went on, though, they could tell that, that, that Jesus wasn't, he, he wasn't the same that he's always been. He was almost like he was becoming more and more disturbed. Something was up. He seemed troubled. And, and if Jesus could be worried, Jesus was worried. 
And then they're kind of wondering, where did Judas run off to? He said he had to run an errand. We kind of expected him back by now. Jesus is getting kind of antsy. He says, all right, guys, we're going to leave. Let, let's go pray. I need to go pray. Let's go to our favorite spot. Let's head over to the Garden of Gethsemane. It's dark. We'll be able to hide in the crowd because I know people are after us. So we'll hide on the side streets. We'll make our way to the garden. He gets there. And he says, we're going to pray, guys. Pray here alone. I'm going to head further into the garden. And I'm going to pray. And he goes off and he prays. And he has this intense conversation with God. You've heard this prayer. It was so intense. And he says, God, I know what's coming next. You know what's coming next. And if it were up to me, I would choose another way. But as always, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus says this prayer. He gets up and he goes to find his disciples and his boys. They're all asleep. And he kind of kicks them. Guys, wake up. Wake up. And back comes Judas. Except he's not alone. He brings hundreds of temple guards with him to arrest Jesus. This was the hour. This was the thing that Jesus had been prepared for. But much to the dismay of his disciples, much to the dismay of his contingency and everyone around him, Jesus didn't put up a fight. Jesus surrenders himself to the temple leaders. And the text tells us that everyone deserted him and fled. The story continues, though. They took Jesus to see the high priest. All the chief priests were there, the elders, the teachers of the law. They all came together. They had never been this close to Jesus before. They, they, they'd seen him from a distance, but they never had this, this opportunity to be close enough where they could touch him, to look into his eyes, to have a conversation. They had always been on the outskirts of the crowd. They'd been, they'd been the ones that, that Jesus was talking about. They'd never been this close before. And now they were close enough to see him. They were close enough to touch him. And now they outnumbered Jesus. He wasn't with his crowd. He wasn't with his disciples. He wasn't with his apostles. He was alone and this emboldened them and they look into this man this innocent man's eyes they begin to make accusation after accusation and as we begin to read this narrative of, of these last few hours of jesus life you're going to wonder if you've ever read this before where did the disciples get this kind of information because they weren't there they fled the text tells us so where did they know all this we have four accounts of jesus life matthew mark luke and john and then after that, we have a book called the book of Acts. Luke writes the book of Acts. And in Acts, it's kind of the history of the church. And in that book, Luke tells us that many, many, many Pharisees turned to faith. They became followers of Jesus after Jesus died and was resurrected. They became followers of Jesus, not because of what Jesus taught, but because of his resurrection. Because after his resurrection, it was undeniable of who Jesus was and what he had claimed to be. And sure enough, these Pharisees, as they became Jesus followers, would meet with these gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and share this incredible detail of what happens on the night of Jesus' betrayal leading to his death. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin, this is the entire Jewish Supreme Court, were looking for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they didn't find any. He was an innocent man and they couldn't find a charge against him. Many testified falsely against him, against Jesus, but their statements didn't agree. They couldn't even line up false statements against Jesus. And then they would ask Jesus a direct question. This is the chief priest. He, he, he's kind of getting down to the heart of the matter. It's getting intense. He's getting frustrated because nothing's working the way he wants it to work. It, 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 the intensity is kind of building. And he just gets right to the heart of it. The high priest stood up before them all and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer at all. Finally, the chief priest stands up and asks the question they all want to know the answer to, the answer that falls right into their plan. Again, the high priest asks him, are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? And at this moment, Jesus held his future and really our future in his hands. The answer to this question would dictate the next few hours. And Jesus replies, I am. At that moment, the high priest tore his clothes. This was a sign of regret and anguish. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You've heard this. We've all heard this. We're all witness to it. You've heard his blasphemy. And they all condemned Jesus. They condemned him as worthy of death. And then the temple guards stepped in. And some began to spit at him, and they blindfolded him. They struck him with fists and yelled at him, prophesy. And the guards took him, and they beat him. The men in the room who were in charge, who had <clears throat> thought they had everything they needed now to build their case against Jesus, now they're trying to figure out their next step. And my guess is they spend hours throughout the night putting their plan together. How can they move this forward fast enough to execute Jesus as quick as possible? We're not sure if they got any sleep, but I'm almost positive Jesus got no sleep that night. 
The text tells us that very early in the morning, the chief priests with elders, the teachers of the law, the whole Sanhedrin, they made their plans because they had determined that Jesus was guilty. But they still needed the Romans to be involved. They still needed the Romans to execute their plan. You see, they couldn't put anyone to death. They needed Rome for that. So they developed this plan of how do we get Pilate on board? And how do we do this quickly? How do we move quickly and get Pilate to agree with us so that we can put this man to death? And they wanted to do this all in one day. They wanted to do this all before Passover hit so that they could go and celebrate Passover, so that they could get back to business as usual, so that the people would disperse from the city, let go of these messianic aspirations, so that they could put an end to this rabbi and this teacher and move on with their lives. So they developed a plan. They bound Jesus and they led him away and they handed him over to Pilate. Now Pilate, he was the governor of Judea in the city of Jerusalem. And this is in the province of Samaria. He'd been governor there for about seven years. And we know this from history that Pilate hated the Jews. He didn't like being in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, his home wasn't in Jerusalem. His home was on the coast. And he would stay there the majority of the time. He'd only make his way into the city around these kind of festivals, these holidays, only to keep peace because he knew at this time, this is where the rabble rousers come. This is when chaos ensues. This is when intensity builds. So he's in the city for the Passover. He's in the city for these days where he knows things are going to be intense and and there's going to be some kind of chaos. But he doesn't like the Jews. As a matter of fact, he doesn't like the Jewish leaders at all, so much so that he really enjoys kind of lording his power over them. He really likes to kind of egg them on. He loves when he can kind of twist the knife as that, that Rome is sovereign and Rome is over you. And even you, with all of your religion and all of your ideas about you being the chosen people, you're nothing when it compares to Rome. So they bring Jesus to Pilate. By now, it was early in the morning. The sun's beginning to come up. And to avoid any ceremonial uncleanliness, they did not. These are the teachers of the law, the Pharisees, the elders, the Sanhedrin. They didn't enter Pilate's palace because they wanted to be able to celebrate Passover. So to prepare for Passover, they had to do all these ceremonial cleaning things so that they could lead in Passover and celebrate Passover. And they knew that if they were to kind of cross the threshold into Pilate's palace, that they would be seen as unclean because he was a Gentile and he was dirty and he's no good. And they didn't want to do that because they wanted to celebrate Passover. And it's all to be done in a few hours so we can go enjoy our meal. Hurry up, Pilate, let's kill him. They wouldn't enter into Pilate's palace. So Pilate had to come out to them. Just imagine the hypocrisy of these men. They were so concerned about their cleanliness, they wouldn't enter into Pilate's palace, yet they were willing to put an innocent man on trial, an innocent man that they had fabricated false testimonies against. They wanted to crucify an innocent man, but don't make me unclean so I can enjoy dinner tonight. So Pilate, he had no choice because they wouldn't come in. He came out to them and he asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? They kind of had their statement prepared. You can imagine they pull out their paper, their note cards. Well, Pilate, Pilate, he said, Pilate, if you were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. It's kind of their way of saying, hey, Pilate, like, if this weren't a big deal, we wouldn't have come to you. Pilate, if, if this weren't serious, we would have come to you. Really, Pilate, we're just, we're just here because we need a favor from you. We can't do what we want on our own. We need you on our side. So we're, just, we're bringing him here because this is a big deal to us, and we need you on board. We need you to give us a favor. And Pilate loved when people came to him for favors, especially these Jewish people who he just kind of hated. He said, then go ahead, take him for yourselves and judge him by your own law. It's kind of begging them on. Come on, beg me, plead for me. Let me show you how powerful Rome is and how weak your God and you Israelites and you Jewish people are. Rome was sovereign over this Jewish rebel state and he wanted them to know it. He wanted them to acknowledge Rome as ultimate sovereignty. But they said, we have no right to execute anyone. They objected. Now Pi saying, ah, see, that's, that's what it is. That's what you need. You can't even do what you want to do without me. You can't even perform your own religious laws, your own religious duties without my help. It's really all coming back to me. And then Pilate did something to irritate them. He went back into his palace, knowing that they wouldn't follow him because they were getting ready for Passover. And he insisted that Jesus follow him. The text says that Pilate went back inside to the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? 
And outside, the religious leaders are angry. They're scared. They're worried. They know that Jesus has the ability to win over the crowds. They know that Jesus has the ability to win over the nation. He's already proven that before. What's he going to say to Pilate? Is he going to win Pilate over? Why did they go inside? What, like, what are they saying? Why doesn't he come outside and do this? Well, what's Jesus going to do? And they're worried. Their entire plan is going to, going to fall apart. That this whole thing that they had hatched to get Jesus, to arrest him, to, to execute him, is going to completely fall apart because they have no idea what Jesus was going to do. Clearly, Jesus had no problem going in with Pilate. After all, he was bound. But even if he wasn't bound, Jesus had no problem going in and spending time with Gentiles and sinners. That was part of the problem with Jesus. He was nothing like these religious leaders. He had no problem spending time with people they wouldn't associate with. So Pilate goes to the heart of the matter because he's heard this rumor before. He's heard about this rabbi who's causing all this trouble. He's heard about this rabbi who's coming into the city streets and being honored as king. His soldiers have told him about this rabbi, this teacher, that's stirring up chaos. And, 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 and all these people are beginning to get wound up. Surely he's heard the stories. But he's never been close enough to Jesus to ask. Are you the king of the Jews, he asks. Jesus responds, is that your own idea? Or did others talk to you about me? Now Pilate is kind of on edge a little bit. Am I a Jew? Pilate says, am I a Jew? Your own people, the chief priests, they handed you over to me. Now tell me, what have you done? Jesus, what reason are we here? Why did they get me so up so early in the morning? I don't even want to be here. I want to be on the coast, enjoying my family. Like, let me get back to my life. Why are we here? Jesus goes back to the original question. He begins to answer his question this way. He acknowledges that he's king, and this is how he answers. Jesus said, my kingdom is not, is not of, it's not like, it's nothing you've seen before. It's not designed around the kingdoms of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, Pilate, if it were of this world, this would play out the same way any leader who has followers. This would play out the same way any king who has followers. This would play out the same way it does all the time. If it were of this world, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. Pilate, we know how this is going to play out. But my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, I would out-roam Rome. I would outdo you. I would use force and violence just like you do, and no one would be able to do it better. But you see, Pilate, here's the thing. My kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is like nothing you've ever seen before. As a matter of fact, my kingdom is like nothing that's ever been on this planet. Pilate kind of nods. Ah, he says, you are a king then. Pilate goes back out to the crowd. He announced to the chief priest in the crowd, look, I find no basis for a charge against this man. But the crowd, the religious leaders, the chief priests, they insisted. He stirs up the people all over Judea by his teaching. And then someone, I imagine, slipped this as, as the chief priest, I'm sure, warned them, don't say this, whatever you do, don't mention Galilee. But somebody in the crowd speaks up and says, he started in Galilee and he's come all the way here. And now Pilate begins to smile. Oh, Galilee. He's a Galilean. Well, that's not even my jurisdiction. That's not even my territory. Guys, you're wasting my time. You don't bring him to Pilate. He's from Galilee. You bring him to Herod. Go find Herod. Don't bring him to me. And we've heard of Herod. Herod the Great. He was the guy who... who who built the, rebuilt the temple. Herod the Great was the guy who sent all of his henchmen into the town of Bethlehem to kill every boy two years old and younger because he was worried about this prophesied king who would come and replace him. Well, Herod the Great did that because he was worried about somebody replacing him. And you know what Herod did? He did what everyone does. He died. And somebody replaced him. His kids replaced him. And now Herod, his son, is kind of ruler over Galilee. And Herod, just like Pilate, doesn't like to be in the city except on religious holidays when he knows there's going to be trouble and he knows that, that things are going to be stirred up. And, and Herod is actually in town. He's actually in the same town, but at a different part of town. And Pilate knows this. He's thinking, why did you bring him to me? You don't bring him to me. you got to go bring him to Herod. Herod's actually in town. Go take this man to Herod. So Pilate, like many others, never able to get close to him never able to have a conversation with Jesus. He sends him off to Herod. Herod begins to interview Jesus. He's thrilled. You can actually read this for yourselves. He's thrilled to get Jesus in his presence. And he begins to poke and prod and ask questions. And Jesus doesn't say a thing. He doesn't say a word. And then Herod begins to taunt Jesus. Hey, Jesus, you're like a magician, right? Do some tricks for me. Do, so, do me some tricks. I want to see your tricks. Show me some tricks. Hey, guys, bring something out here for Jesus to do a trick. Jesus doesn't say a word. 
Herod gets fed up because Herod's not hearing what he wants to hear. He's not seeing what he wants to see. So he sends Jesus back to Pilate. Imagine this going on throughout the day. These religious leaders are just intense. They want this done before sundown. And all of this changing, moving around from, town, from one side of town to the other. Jesus ends up back in front of Pilate. Pilate brings back all of the accusers again. He says, you brought me this man, the one who was inciting a rebellion. Hey guys, do you hear a rebellion? Yeah, me neither. You bring him to me and I have examined him in your presence and I find no basis for a charge against him. And by the way, neither is Herod because he sent him back to us. As you can see, he has done nothing to deserve death. Therefore, just to appease you, just to make you happy, just to get you off my doorstep so I can go back to my life, finish this, this horrible day and go back to the coast where I want to be. Therefore, I will punish him and then release him. But the whole crowd went crazy, and they shouted, Away with this man! And then Pilate had his soldiers take Jesus, and they had him flogged. Now, for a first century person, you didn't need to explain what a flogging was. But for us, it's kind of lost. You see, what Roman soldiers would do is they'd take this man, two soldiers, and they'd bind his hands, and they'd, they'd stretch his hands up as far as he would go, so his torso is long and narrow. And they'd get a cat of nine tails, two of them. And on the end of the, the, the strips of leather would be bone and metal and rock. And they would begin to whip him one at a time, taking turns, counting, because even the Romans had rules against, about flogging. And as they would whip him and as they would flog him, the cords would wrap around and it would rip layer of layer of layer of skin off the man's back. But it would also rip layer and layer and layer of skin off the man's torso. It would leave him raw. Most people would die from a flogging just from blood loss. They took Jesus outside, an innocent man, falsely accused, and they flogged him, and they beat him. And now here's the thing, we have to stop and we have to talk about this for a moment. Because as 21st century people, we've kind of, we've kind of romanticized this story a little bit. We, we, we've kind of, uh, kind of whitewashed the story a little bit because we don't, we don't see and we weren't a part of and we, we don't understand the intensity and the graphic nature of, of, what, of what happened. The truth is, for, for most of us, and maybe this is, this is your, your case, you heard the story as you were a child, but when your parents read it to you and when you get these cute little Easter books like the one we're going to give away next week, all the violence is kept out of it. All, all the blood and the guts and the gore is kept out of it. But that's not the way it happened. This story can't be sanitized. This story can't be romanticized. As if somehow this was some deeply spiritually moving moment. It wasn't. It was intense. It was horrible. Jesus had been beaten, the Bible says, beyond recognition so his own mother wouldn't recognize him. They beat his face and they spit on him. They whipped him with, a, with this, this flogging method that ripped the skin off his torso. And the truth is, that if we were there and we were watching and we were experiencing what these people have experienced, we would all look away. This wouldn't be something that's talked about. This wouldn't be something that shows up in, in art somewhere or kids draw pictures of. In horror, we would look away. The soldiers then twisted together a crown of thorns and they put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe. They put it on his beaten, raw, bloody body. And they went up to him again and again and said, Hail to the king of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. A face that had already been badly bruised and beaten the night before. Once more, Pilate came out to this waiting crowd. And he says to the Jews that have gathered, Look, almost like he's saying, Look at this man. Look at what we've put him through. Surely this is enough. Surely you guys are going to have a little pity and think, all right, that's enough. He's done. You know, he's probably going to die from blood loss anyway. We don't need to go on. Don't, like, Pilate didn't want to do what they're asking him to do. Don't make me do what, I ha what, I, what you want me to do. Like, let me go back to the coast and live my life. I don't want to do this. Look, he says, I am bringing him out to you to let you know I have found no basis for a charge against him. Even when he was being beaten to death, he did not break. Even when he was being flogged, he didn't shout and confess to things that he didn't do in order to receive some mercy. This man is absolutely innocent. But as soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, 
they all shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate can't believe this. He's never seen anything like this. Basically says, I'm done. Look, you take him and you crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. And then the Jewish leaders went into part two of their plan. Since part one was taking so long, they then insisted, we have a law. And Pilate, I know we didn't tell you about this law before, but we, we have a law. It's written somewhere. We can find it for you, I'm sure. We have a law. And according to the law, he must die because he claimed to be the son of God. And when Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid and he went back inside the palace. He was more afraid because this little incident that was happening in Jerusalem, this little thing that he was hoping he could deal with without anyone else knowing, it now wasn't just a Jewish thing. It now was a Roman thing. Now it became serious. Now Pilate knew that he needed to do something he didn't want to do. Because anytime someone claimed to be the son of God, it was viewed as a threat to the empire. It was viewed as a threat to Rome, as a threat to Caesar. And if someone claimed that, they had to be put to death. They had to be punished for it. And Pilate knew it. This was a code word. The Jewish leaders knew it. This was all code to get their plan done, to get their plan that they had kind of plotted behind the scenes, carried out so that they could execute Jesus. Pilate goes back in. And he questions Jesus. The text says he questions him even further, but this time Jesus won't answer him. And, and I love this. In fact, if you're not a Christian and you've kind of went away from the faith, you, you, you know, you believed for a while and you didn't believe, you were turned off from church, somebody said something, and, and, and I, I get it. Like, I, I don't know what made you leave the church, and there's no judgment here. I'm not, nothing like that at all. As a matter of fact, if I were in your shoes, I may have left as well. But I want you to listen to this next line because this is just, it, it, it's so incredible. Pilate, a Roman officer, a Roman soldier who has seen everything. Pilate was amazed. He was amazed at Jesus. He was amazed that he even knew this innocent man wasn't defending himself. This man who, wasn't, who couldn't find even a, a, a crime worthy of being flogged was willfully walking to his death. You see, this is the point when men got on their knees and they begged, but they didn't beg for their life. They begged for a quick and an easy death, and Jesus wouldn't move. He wouldn't answer. This exasperated Pilate. He says to Jesus, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you realize I have the power to free you or crucify you? And Jesus, I'm sure, could have said, then Pilate, why are you the one who's more afraid? But Jesus looks at Pilate and he says this, you would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Pilate, you've seen lots of men die in battle. You've seen men die slowly in battle, and you've seen men die immediately in battle. You've seen men die at the hands of a surgeon, on a table, screaming. You've seen the blood. You've seen the guts. You've seen the gore. You've seen men crucified. But he has never seen anything like this. He's never seen a man like this. A man who was so fully sincere. A man whose eyes were so fully intense. From then on, the text says that Pilate tried everything he could to free Jesus. Pilate believed. But the Jewish leaders, they wouldn't have it. They kept shouting, if you let this man go, and this is part three of, this, of their plan, if you let this man go, then you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And that was it. Checkmate, they had Pilate. They had outmaneuvered Pilate, and Pilate's hands were tied. Even though he believed, even though he wanted Jesus freed, there was nothing he could do. This man opposed Caesar, and it was his responsibility. And when they said this, Pilate knew. Emperor Tiberius has eyes and spies everywhere. Now I have to respond. Now I have to do what I don't want to do. It was the end of the argument. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus and sat down at the judge's seat a place known as the Stone Pavement. There is so much detail in this part of the story. It was about noon. Pilate addresses the crowd and said, Here is your king. You want me to crucify your king? The crowd shouted back, Take him away! Take him away! Crucify him! Pilate asked, Shall I crucify your king? This is what you've been waiting for. 
for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, thousands of years. And you want me to crucify your king. The crowd begins to shout back at Pilate. They shout something back that at any other moment in their life would have been completely blasphemous. But in this moment, to get their plan accomplished, they shout back, We have no king but Caesar. Finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. So the soldiers, these are Pilate's soldiers, took charge of Jesus. They brought him to a place called Golgotha. They offered him wine mixed with word. This was just kind of a small gesture of mercy. But he didn't take it. And as you read this part of the story, all four Gospels, it, it's kind of like time slows down. It's like everything slows down, and, and, and it's line by line, it's word by word, it's, it's, it's conversation by conversation. It's like everything in this moment just begins to kind of slow down. And what happens next? Needs no explanation. They crucified him. Invented by the Greeks, but perfected by the Romans. It could take a man days to die from crucifixion, depending on how healthy he was and how well the Romans did their job. The goal of this wasn't a quick death. It was a long, painful, torturous death. In fact, the crucifixion was so gruesome that it was banned from being shown from Christian leaders. It was banned to being shown in any kind of Christian artwork. Up until the 4th century, where uh, Emperor Constantine came in and actually banned crucifixion as a method of execution. C.S. Lewis writes this, The crucifixion did not become a frequent motif of Christian art until the generations which had actually seen the crucifixion were all dead. There was nothing glamorous about this. You couldn't sanitize it. Crucifixion was a death inflicted upon by many. But church, it was a death chosen by one. Our Savior displayed on a criminal's cross. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. And here's something you should know. This is something you may not know about this part of the story. But this makes the rest of the story so extraordinary. When Jesus died, there were no Christians when Jesus died, there were no believers. When Jesus died, there were no followers. There were sympathizers, but no believers. And here's why. Because throughout his ministry, Jesus claimed too much about himself. The central part of Jesus' ministry, it wasn't his stories, it wasn't even his miracles. It was what he claimed about himself. He claimed to be the resurrection and the life. You can't crucify the resurrection and the life. He claimed to be the son of God or the son of man. The Son of God isn't going to be arrested by some foreign Roman empire. He gave every indication that he was God's Messiah. That they had waited for for hundreds and thousands of years. God's Messiah isn't going to be put to death by a foreign empire. If Jesus was dead, if Jesus was crucified, clearly he was not who he claimed to be. He was not who they believed he was. There was no dream to keep alive. There was no movement to move. It was over. Joseph of Arimathea, a Sanhedrin, part of the Supreme Court, a friend of Nicodemus who we learned about earlier in our journey in Jesus' life, they hugged their kids, they kissed their wives, and then they risked their lives. And they went to Pilate and they asked for Jesus' body. In the first century, a man who had been crucified couldn't be buried. His body was taken from a cross and thrown on a pile of other bodies left for the dogs and the wolves. They went to Pilate, and I'm sure they had to bribe him and exchange some silver. They got permission to take Jesus' body, and they went over to the cross. Before they took Jesus' body, the religious leaders asked if the two uh, criminals on the sides of Jesus, if they could have their legs broken so that they would suffocate, so they wouldn't be able to push their body up to take a breath. When they came to Jesus, they didn't need to do it. Because of his earlier scourging and beatings, Jesus had died. He had bled to death. 
the text tells us, Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, as was the custom, two of them wrapped it with spices and strips, not one big cloth, strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. This was how they embalmed a body. Why would they embalm a body? Why would John tell us this level of detail? Because no one expected Jesus to do anything other than what he had already done. To die and to stay dead. They thought it was the end. They, they, they didn't, they, all that they had thought about Jesus, he wasn't who they thought he was. But he didn't deserve to be thrown on a pile of bodies. He wasn't who they thought he was, but surely he deserved better than this. They embalmed his body in accordance with all the Jewish burial customs. And as the sun set and as Passover began, they made their way home. Confused, dismayed with, I'm sure, a million questions. The next day, Pilate is disturbed once again. <clears throat> this is the one after the preparation day. The chief priests, the Pharisees, they show up at Pilate's doorstep once again. I'm sure Pilate is frustrated thinking, guys, what is it this time? Sir, they said, we remember that while he, while Jesus was still alive, this deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So we have one last favor to ask of you. And this is going to serve us both. This is, this is good for both parties. Would you please give the order for the tomb to be made secure until that third day? Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he was raised from the dead. And this last deception will be far, far worse than the first. Pilate answered, take a guard and go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing it with a stone and posting the guard. That night, everyone slept well. Caiaphas, the high priest, slept well, knowing that his plans worked out perfectly, that he had outsmarted Pilate and outsmarted the Roman Empire and got the Roman Empire to do his bidding, that he had gotten rid of the rabbi, the teacher, the rabble rouser. Pilate slept well, knowing that it was over, that Passover, he had survived another one, and now he could go back to the coast and live with his family like he always wanted to. Up north somewhere, Saul of Tarsus, is preparing another message to speak against Christianity and against this movement, another mind-bending message. Emperor Tiberius is in Rome. He has no idea of the events that transpired. Everything was going back to normal. He was going back to usual because everybody expected Jesus to do what dead people usually do, and that was stay dead. Little did they know. Little did they know that in the next few hours, they would secure their place in history. That their names would be written down and would be talked about for generations and generations. Little did they know that in the next few hours that all of this planning and all the things they had conspired and all the things they put in motion would for cause them to be written about in history books. But not in the way they thought. Their names would be read in history books as a footnote. Because what they meant for the end was just the beginning. It was the beginning of something brand new. It was the beginning of something brand new for you and for me and for the world. You don't want to miss next week. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, God, this story is so incredibly intense and emotional. God, that the level of detail that somehow survived generations after generations that depict this incredible story, the last few hours of this man Jesus' life, I thank you so much that we have it. I thank you that we can look at it, that we can understand. Jesus was willing to do what no one else was willing to do. Many had died from crucifixion, but only one man chose it. And he chose it for me. And he chose it for us. I pray you'd help us through this Easter season, God, to remember what he did. But God, but to remember this wasn't the end. This was merely just the beginning. Give us the wisdom to know what to do with this and the courage to do it. And bring us back next week as we celebrate God, not his death, but his resurrection. In Jesus' name.